Father, we praise you and we thank you, God, for the time you've given us. Lord, I pray that you touch my mind and touch my mouth. Guide me and direct me, Holy Spirit, that I might be a tool that you can use to, to be a light in this world. Lord, to be a help wherever I go. Jesus, holy name I pray. Amen. Uh, I want to start out tonight by saying we got some good news this evening. Next Monday, we will go live in 77 different facilities all over the nation. That's the first company uh, that that signed on. The other one's still in the process of approving everything, so I'm just very excited that, that, that we'll have 11,000 tablets out there that people can get these videos on. The videos are the first thing that is coming on, that they're putting online, and then they she says they're going to go back and, and make videos out of all the podcast material, and it's just audio, so it, it, it'll, it should go quicker than what it has for the videos. But tonight, I, I want to talk about something that we have, uh, we've talked a little bit about it before, but this is week 11 of, of this In Him Scripture study, and, and Ephesians 1.10 in the King James Version, it says that in the dispensation of the future of times, in the fullness of times, he might gather together in, all, in one all things, Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, this is talking about when everything wraps up, the church is pulled out, everything's done, where we'll end up. And, and to be unified. And this is what the Amplified Classic. But I'm going I'm to go with the New Living Translation. It says, And this is the plan. At the right time, He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 1.10 says, He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things, and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and, and things on earth. Now, the Lord, uh, I asked him, I said, where do you want me to go with this? Because, you know, this is, this is something we talked about two or three weeks ago, about when, when, when the Lord calls the church out and everything's done, it, we're all going to be where we're supposed to be. And, and he's going to unify everything in heaven and earth, and everything's going to be right. But he keeps guiding me back to unity. Unity in, 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 in doctrine. I, I, t I told him at the jail earlier this week, we were talking about this scripture, and, and unity in doctrine, you asked a, a room full of people, 35 people about one scripture, and you'll get an opinion, a different opinion from every one of them. We'll never be in unity in doctrine. That's the reason there's 7,000 churches between here and the uh, Hiawassee River. There's churches everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible don't talk about unity in doctrine. You know what it talks about? Unity in faith. Unity, unity in faith in Him. And what he wants to do. God wants to bring us all together where we're at today. So that we can pull the, this lost and dying world into his kingdom. And show them that there's more to a Christian life than just, just being, being born again. I mean, that for years I thought being born again was just it. And that was just the door. That was the door to God's kingdom. And there was so much more that, that was there for a Christian if they just believe it and stand in it. But being unified and, and being in unity with each other, there's common ground in a Christian's life with other Christians. And that's Christ. What, what he done for me, he'll do for you. I was talking to a guy today. I said, look, I said, God loves the abortion doctor just as much as he loves the babies they're killing He's no respecter of person. The love of God is far deeper than mankind will ever, ever realize 
and understand. Ever see it in this, in this day and time. I read Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, five days a week on my podcast. And it's basically Paul's prayers for the Ephesians. Paul wanted the Ephesians to have their eyes open to the love and the mercy and the grace and the goodness that God had for them. And, and God used a Pharisee, a man that had been trained in the law since he was a child. He used a Pharisee to tur- turn him around 180 degrees and, and, and teach the grace and the love and the mercy with the same diligence and the same persistence that he taught the law in. I mean, Paul was a, a zealot when it come to, to making sure all the T's were dotted and all, the, uh, and all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. He wanted everything perfect. Well, to, today we look at his writings and we see just how much he wanted the, wanted the Christian, the church, to realize where they stood in God's eyes after Christ died. Jesus Christ done something that we'll never be able to do in this life for ourselves. And he done it free. Didn't cost anybody anything. It cost him everything. But yet he gave his heart and his life. He gave his life's blood so that we could stand up and come to a place in our lives to know and realize that, that, my goodness, how strong how strong we can be in Him, in what He has 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 died to give us. Now, this uh, the Philippians three and nine in the King James version. It says, "And be found in Him." Now, this is Paul talking about himself. It says, "And be found in Him, not having my own righteousness." which is of the law, but that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The New Living Translation says, and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. The the Amplified Classic says, and that I may actually be found and known as in him, not having any self-achieved righteousness that that, that can be called my own, based on my own obedience to the law's demands, ritualistic uprightness, and supposed right standing with God thus acquired by myself. It says, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the anointed one, the truly right standing with God, which comes from God by saving faith, by faith in him. Paul Paul was talking about himself. He said, I want to be found in Christ Jesus, in my Lord and Savior, I, you you talk you read the Damascus scriptures where it's talking about the Damascus road, and when Paul was struck down, he he said he said Paul, don't you find it hard to fight against me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He already made up his mind. This 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 this, this being that that had a hold of him was where he, the one he needed to be looking to. And, and he, he completely changed right there on that road. Gave his heart and his life to the one that died for him. And God took a Pharisee, one that had, that had been trained up to persecute the church and turned him around and made him a mouthpiece for us to live in. For, him, for us to take his words and 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 grow in them, grow, not in not in wisdom of man, but in in faith in what Jesus Christ done. Because you can't you can't get any, get any more saved than you are. I don't care how hard you work at it. I don't care how hard you work at it. 
You're just as born again today as you were the day you asked Christ to save you. But yet somewhere along the line, people decide they want to they help him out. And, and they, they want to work, work, work real hard. Well, that's great. I tell them all the time at the jail, look, morals and ethics are a big, big part of a Christian life. But they don't save you. It's, the, it, it's not the root of your salvation. Morals and ex- ethics are the fruit of your salvation. But it's not the root of your salvation. I heard a minister say this, and he said, this is my definition. Now, don't go saying that I, I, I uh, said that this was uh, a biblical definition of grace. But he said, this is my definition, and it stands to reason if you'll just think about it. He said, he said my definition of God's grace is God's desire to treat you like you have never sinned. My goodness. Think about that. But how, how else could you come to God, come to his, his throne boldly, his throne of grace boldly? How else could you come other than him not seeing you as you are in this bag of bones that we live in? That's the only way. And when he saw, said that, I'm like, man, that's the truth. God's desire, God's grace is his desire to treat us, us like we've never done anything wrong. And he has to look at us like that because if he looked at us in the way that we have lived and grown up and the mistakes we've made, we, we wouldn't have a chance in the world to do anything. We, it, it'd be over with. And that's the reason I, I do this study and that's the reason I'm so adamant on, on getting this, this podcast into every one of the jails and prisons in this nation. Not just a few of them. A lot of people says, well, you got you know, 77 going online Monday, and you got 800 that's, that's about to do That's a pretty good lick. Well, I understand that, but that ain't nowhere near the 6,296 6, of them. And I ain't, I ain't slowing down while I get all of them. And it'll be a constant, you know, people, people uh, retire, so you got to convince the one that's got put in the job that you got to keep that on there. You know what I'm saying? It's a constant, constant working at it. So there ain't no stopping place. There's no stopping place. When you, Paul said it, he said, and become one with him. In other words, he said, I'm not walking through this life on my own merit anymore. He done that for the biggest part of his life until he gave his heart and life to Christ Jesus. He said, what did it say? And become one and be found in him. He said, I, I, I want to do everything I can to come. Now, Missy, would you put up that Colossians 128? I know where it goes now. I knew I needed it, but I didn't know where, where to tell her to put it. This is, we're going to look at this scripture later in the study. But Colossians 128, Paul says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. He said, I strive to teach every man and present them to God. He wanted us to come to understand that we need to be mature in who we are. And if we can't stand before God with the confidence and the contentment and, and just, I'm talking about being all the confidence in the world, when you come to God, if the Bible says to come boldly. Now, that's a, big, that's a hard pill to swallow for most people, to present every man perfect before Christ, before God, or pre- pre- present him to God in Christ Jesus, perfect. But think about that. If God is looking at us through Jesus Christ, was he not that perfect sacrifice? Are we not hiding Behind his goodness, he washed us clean. And when we come to realize this, I, I can see it working. I see it working in, in a lot of people that have left that jail. But this just ain't about me. This is about 
God working through this ministry to teach 100,000 others that I come in contact with to take this study and get in these prisons and teach. It can change. I, I know it. it. It's not nothing that I've done. It's what God has written down in this book. If we will, if we will allow people to come to the realization of who they are in Christ Jesus. And I, when I first taught a year and a half ago, when I start, started reading that scripture, that was a hard pill to swallow for me because I was still in the mindset of, boy, you know, I know where you've been. I look you in the mirror every morning, right? That, that's something that today we live in a place that could fall apart overnight that quick. You better have confidence in where you stand with God. You better know exactly where you stand with Him because one of these days we could wake up and this world be completely different. I want to be just exactly where I need to be in, in Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And until that I am convinced, and I am, ain't nobody, no, no, nobody going to change my mind. I preached at church Sunday, last Sunday, and, and I said, there's no sense in trying to come and tell me that my past has anything to do with who I am today. Because it's, it's that, 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 that train left the station. I run that dog off because that man died a long time ago. I didn't realize he died until just a few years ago. But now, today, I look at this and I know that I am found in him in my, in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to believe that. And I'm going to stand on that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to convince anybody that I can the same thing. Because I, I, it's not anything that I've done, but it's everything that Jesus Christ died to give us. It's a free gift. And, and, and it's ours. But we've got, to, we've got to come to a place in our life that we can say, you know, you're right. God's Word is true above all opinion, and I'm going to believe that regardless of how I feel. Because there's people in this world that have messed up terribly. The jails are full of them. There's 2.4 million inmates in this nation right now locked up. But they don't have to be bound by their past. Regardless of whether they're bound in these prisons or not, they don't have to be bound in their past. I, I walked into the uh, jail Monday or Tuesday and met a guy that had went through the biggest part of this study and got shipped off. He's back for other charges that, uh, that he's having to answer for, but he got a 10-year sentence in Pine Knot, Kentucky, in a federal prison. He says, Stacy, you wouldn't believe it. And I've talked about him before. He was an a, a assistant pastor right here in Cleveland for years and got messed up. He told, told me years ago, when he was, when he was in, in the jail here the first time, he said, I got mad. He said, I'm sitting in my cell reading my Bible and just threw it. He said, I, ain't mad. I ain't, wasn't mad at God. I was mad at myself because this is as simple as putting one foot in front of the other, and I didn't see it for years and years and years, and now I'm having to answer for, it, for all my mess up. But he's, he's, in, uh, he's back in Cleveland, to answer for other charges, and he wanted me to look up his status, and I did, and it says not in custody, custody of the Federal Bureau of Prison. He said, huh. He said, well, he said, I guess I'll go back to that place. He said he's been there a little over a year. It was, it was before I went, or I had my episode in January, so it's been a little over a year since he's been gone and come back. He said, I've watched six people get stabbed to death in that prison. He said, this is one for a tough play. It's a maximum security. There's a, it, even, the levels they even go higher than that. There's a supermax. And then you don't want any either one of them. 
But he said, I, I was on the phone one day and something bumped my leg. And he said, a man had another man down, just, just killed him right there in front of him. I mean, that's what's happening in these prisons. But can you imagine what would happen if what these scriptures were saying come, become to a, a reality to just a few of them? That they could stand up and say, hang on, hang on a minute. Now, there's more here to, to, to live for than they are to, to die for. You understand what I'm talking about? This, this word is freedom. If we, can, if we can get it to them. Freedom. Freedom to walk past all the junk that's going on around you and say, no, I'm not a part of that anymore. I'm, I am in Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. God looks at me. I've been found in him. That's what Paul said about himself. He said, my, my, uh, my good deeds, my, my uh, abiding by the law merits me nothing. What merits me something is my faith in Christ Jesus for what he done. The world needs to know this. The 340 million people in the United States need to know this. The 7 billion people on this planet needs to know this. And, and all, we, all we can do is continue to put it out and depend on people like this lady that's putting these in this 77 facilities to continue to keep putting it out and put it in all these others because these inmates have families. They have families. And when they, these families see what it's doing for the inmates, guess what? It's going to help them. It's going to change them. It's not going to happen overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. But I promise you something, one thing. I'm going to be driving nails so I'll take my last breath. Because this is important. Who we are in Jesus Christ is the most important thing that you'll ever learn after you're born again. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced of it. Let's go on to the next one. Colossians 2 and 6. It says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That New Living Translation says, And now just as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. The Amplified Classic says, as you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus the Lord, so walk, regulate your lives, and conduct yourself in union and conformity to Him. You say, how in the world do I do that? We talked about it last week. Talk about it a lot. How, how do I walk in Him? You walk in His love. Romans 5 and 5 says it. For the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of God is in us. A lot of times we don't allow it to get out. It took me a long time, and, and he's not here tonight, but my pastor has been a testament to the love that God will put in your heart, and, and if you'll let it out, you, I'm, I'm talking about you can minister to people in that love. I can't minister to somebody grabbing them by the ear and say, come here, I want to talk to you. It, no matter how bad I want to. You understand what I'm talking about? You, you can't do that. But walking and, and finding yourself, like Colossians 2 and 6 says, therefore receive Christ, so walk you in Him. If I'm going to walk in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I'm going to have to, Allow God's love that is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, by God's Spirit, come out. And, and have pity on people and love them. Even though they've screwed up, screwed up bad, I come in contact with them over and over. That man I was talking about, I mean, he's, he's, he's done some jacked up stuff. He's looking at a 26-year sentence. On top of a 10-year sentence he's already uh, been uh, convicted of, and he's 68 years old. 68 years old. So what? He said, I've got my, my life done. Free. But he don't, you know, what, what he is in, the, in that jail, free or not, 
He's born again and he knows it now. There's a major difference in this. And walking in the love, I, I can see it in, in so many of them. That place is just a lot calmer when you walk into it. I'll tell you what happened. Monday morning, I went into a pod, and they'd been having some, some uh, issues with a, with a guy that come in, and he was just trying to push butt. You know how people are. They come in the door and they want to see what they can get what they can buy with. And, and one of the, the ones that's been doing this study, he has a Bible study seven days a week in there. I mean, I'm so excited to see. Well, I told him, I said, you're doing a whole lot more in this pod than I am. I'm in here once a week. You're in here seven days a week. And he, and he has it diligently every day. But then somebody got put in that pod trying to get him to stop it. And was doing his best to cause a fight. He told him, said, I'm not fighting with you. He said, but I'm not going to quit doing what I'm doing. He said, he, he, uh, it was Tuesday when I come in. And he said, you remember last Tuesday when you, you were in here? I said, yeah. He said, uh, he said I'm going to tell you what God done. He said, uh, the guy was up above him in his bunk. And he said, at that day when you left, the next morning, before anybody ever got stirred up, there's three officers come in the door and snatched him off that, off that top bunk, packed up all his junk, and took him to the hole. He said, I found out later that there were seven men in this pod wrote, wrote a grievance against him because what he was doing was hindering them being fed. And they just went to him and said, look, we got a problem in here, and y'all need to address it. Well, they did. They put him in the hole, took him completely out of the equation. God does things like that when you'll just step back and say, I ain't fighting with you. I ain't fussing. I ain't arguing. But I ain't stopping what I'm doing either. I'm going to keep plugging. That's the love of God. And I've seen that in so many of those men over there. Just completely their demeanor has changed. The way they operate has changed. Why? Because they're finally realizing that God is in me. There's, there's, there's times that I've walked through my life, and I doubted it. I really did. I doubt. Am I really born again? Because all the, the, the strife and the, and just the, no, I can't say hatred. I never said I. I never think I've ever hated anybody, but just be some. Just plumb mad at people. 2012, when I uh, I came back to the Lord, I don't never forget it. I didn't know where the scripture was at. I do today, but I didn't know where the scripture was at till later. But I said, Lord, forgive me. And He said, You, if I'm gonna forgive you, and I will, you got a whole lot of forgiving to get to do. And I did. I had so much strife and pent up just just mad at the world. And I really wasn't mad at them. I was mad at myself. But Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, when you stand praying, forgive so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. And I see that all over that jail. You, you can just, you can see the love of God start coming out of some people when they really realize that God is for me. He loves me and he has made me a new creature. And they, they, they start becoming convinced of it instead of just being think, thinking that somebody's preaching at them and telling them that, that's the way you ought to think. Well, being convinced of something, it may take a long time. Romans 12 and 2. And I thought about this video tonight, and uh, we don't know how to run it, but we've ran it in here before, that coffee. Romans 12 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. By the renewing of your mind. I've never seen a, a better illustration of that, that base with all that coffee in it and that water coming into that coffee and pushing it all out and making it clear. That, that coffee represents the world and all the junk that, that gets poured into us through our ears and our eyes. And, and, and it takes a whole lot to wash it out. But I promise you, there's plenty enough right here to wash every bit of that ugly out every man, woman, and child on this planet, but we've got to put it in there. 
continuously put it in there. And I'm not talking about running around with the Bible stuck to your forehead. Don't be a nut. Because there's some nuts in this world, and they get wound up so tight that nobody wants to be around them. And did she do it? Look at there. That woman's smart, boy, I'm telling you. Paul, I know you and Brian think y'all got the best wives in the world, but my, the best one's sitting right back there. Uh, let's go on. Uh, 2, 6, and 7. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Rooted and built up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Colossians 2, 7. Rooted and built up in him. Established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to quote uh, Psalms 1 and 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. I said all that to say this. Have you ever been floating down the river and you see a tree that the whole bank has been washed out from under it, and it's still standing there just as straight and healthy, as, and the roots run back into that bank, and it's locked in. They might, they've probably... 20 or 30,000 pounds hanging there in midair. You know why that is? Because that mug's feeding off that water. He, he's feeding off something that, that he's got an endless supply of strength. And the only thing that's going to get that, that, that tree to fall in that water is for that water just to keep eroding it out and eroding it out, and that thing will stand there for hundreds of years in midair with all those roots stuck back in that ground because he's got all kinds of food that it's living in and living, living through. Let me read the, the uh, New Living Translation. It says, let your roots grow down into him, into, in, into God's word, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, I read something today that, that really got my attention. The end of faith will always be thankfulness. If I'm, if I'm speaking on something, in the end, I'm always thankful that what God's Word says about that that I'm believing for I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be thankful that I'm going to stand on what it says. Be thankful for what God has said about a situation you're dealing with and stand and praise Him that His Word says that even though you don't see the answer right then. What what we got to do? We, we've got to stand and speak to that mountain believing without a shadow of doubt that our faith our faith is going to move that mountain. Our faith in what? Our faith in God. What did Jesus say to the woman that uh, touched the hem of his garment? He said, your faith has made you whole. That healing has a lot to do with us. He done it all. He took stripes for every, every, every sickness we'll ever, we'll ever run, in, run into. But we have to stand up and say, I'm going to take that for me. That mountain's got to be removed out of my life. There's so many, so many people that leave this, this earth long before they're supposed to because they don't know who they are in Christ Jesus and they, they, therefore they cannot see themselves being given the things that they've already been given 2,000 years ago. Uh, Pastor talks about this. He's talked about it for weeks. 2 Corinthians 5.19 For God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus Christ died on the cross for every living human being on this planet. Does that mean everybody's saved? Absolutely not. We've got to come to him and, and accept him as our Lord and Savior by faith in what he has done. Well, healing's the same way. A lot of churches don't teach healing like we do. This church teaches if, if you're sick, there's a remedy for it. Jesus Christ took stripes on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago for that sickness. We don't have to, to, to die in our sickness. No, we can believe for our healings because he done it long, long, long time ago before we were ever thought about. He made, he made uh, preparation for our sickness. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to speak to that mount. It's, that may be Mount Everest size and tell it to go and believe in our heart that we're going to have exactly what we say. And we'll get it when we, when we become convinced and, and start thanking him for what he's already done, regardless of where we, where we stand, what we see in our life. There's a lot of people in this world that I'd give anything that I, if I could convince them of where they stand in the whole big plan of God. There's so many millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, that have struggled their entire life. There's people that have lived on this earth and died on this earth, never finding out what's just as plain as the nose on your face when it comes to this book. They struggled their entire life. And really, when they laid down and died, God's grace carried them through because they still laid down and thought, have I really done what I'm supposed to do? Because religion will put you in that, that state of mind. Never again. Never again. We got one more. Colossians 2 and 10. It says, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of of all principalities. Now, right there, I want to stop just a second. If we are complete in Christ Jesus, and we are, I'll just say it, we're in complete, we're complete in Him. And what was I talking about yesterday? Uh, the def that man's definition of God's grace is that God wants to treat us like we've never done anything wrong. Well, Read on, which is the head of all principalities. Well, if we are complete in Christ Jesus, and he's the head of all principalities and power, where are we in this equation? Can we not stand up and say, get under my feet, go somewhere and leave, because I'm not, put, I'm not dealing with you no more. That, put that rat picture up there, honey. Uh, th that picture, that thing's hanging all over that jail. I've, I don't know how many uh, copies of that I've made. But that right there is what we're dealing with every day. Hollywood's made the devil eight foot tall and bulletproof. A refrigerator with a head on it, arms and legs, and undefeatable. But that is what we're dealing with. Look, can you look up? Isaiah 14, 16, I'm, I'm depending on her tonight. Isaiah 14, 16. Now, this is an illustration of what Isaiah 14, 16 says. And I just about know what it says, but I'm going to let her look it up and see if we can get it. Is that they, that they see, they, that they... They that see shall see shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdom? Talking about that rat. That rat. That's what we're dealing with, fellas. That's what we're dealing with. And if we'll put things in perspective, and find out that we're the one that's got him by the nap of the neck, we'll just live in that. 
I've said this over and over in, the, in here, in the jail, and everywhere I go. This game is fixed if we'll just play it. A good lawyer knows the law, but a great one knows the judge. My, my heavenly father is the judge. My Lord and Savior is the, that, that great lawyer that, that stands at the right hand of my father and says he's mine. He may have made a mistake yesterday or five minutes ago, but he's mine. I died for him. He done that for every living human being that walked the face of the planet. And there's so many people out here that have been convinced that their, their sin, their problems, their predicament is so much different than mine. It's a lie. What's, what's the Bible talk about? Is the, the, the things that come against us are just common to man. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. So if the devil can only come against us with things that are common to everybody around or some people around, we've got him whipped. All he, all he can do is run around and and, and scream like a, and act like a, a lion, but he really isn't. He's that rat. He's that rat. I mean, it's, it, it makes me run around, the, run around the house sometimes because when, when I look at somebody in a position that I know without a shadow of a doubt that, that they can overcome it like that if they'll realize what they're dealing with, if they'll realize that they, they, that they are complete in Christ Jesus. And he is the head of all principalities and power. Let me read these last two. It says, so you also are complete through your union. This is the New Living Translation. It says, so you all are also complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. If we're in him, we're the same overcomer. Jesus said it, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And if you're in him, guess what? You're the same overcomer that he is. How can we stand before a, a holy and a righteous and a loving God without the confidence of who we stand in. There's millions that are, that are doing their best to do all they can do to live a Christian life, but the devil beats them to death. That rat beats them to death every day of their life because they don't know who they are. They don't know the promises that God has made to them through Jesus' sacrifice. has nothing to do with their righteousness. has nothing to do with anything other than faith in him. And what he has done. Now this last one. It says. And you are in him. Listen to this. Made full. And having come to fullness of life. In Christ. You too are filled. With the Godhead. Father. Son. Holy Spirit. And reach full spiritual stature. And he. And he is. The head of all rule. And authority. Over every angelic principality and power. And we abide in him. Not only has he saved us, but he has sanctified us. He has given us the everything that we'll ever need to walk through this life and keep our heads held high. I, there, that's one thing that I see every, every, about every day I'm in there. You see people walking around like this because they're so enveloped in, in their head. I'm stuck in this pod. You go in, you go in, you go in, a, in a pod where there's cells in it and they only get out right now an hour, maybe an hour and a half a day and then they go right back in that closet. And they stay there for 23 hours, 23 hours. It's a sad existence. I'm talking about it's an awful existence. You go into the workhouse, and it's just a big old room. So 
probably about the size of this church, but there's, there's bunks on top of each other, bunk beds. And you'll see some of them, I'll come in there, and they will walk a circle in that, in that, whole, in that workhouse the whole time I'm there. And most of the time, it's like this. Because they, you can just see it. It's in the, it's how they carry themselves. It's how, it's how they, yeah, they look. There's one guy come in, and when, when I come in there, he'll come over and bump my fist and say, man, it's good to see you. But he never stops walking. He'll stop by, he'll, he'll walk around the table and listen, but he never sits down. Why? I, I couldn't imagine being in that position. I couldn't imagine what, what people go through. So when, when I say that teaching, teaching this world who they are in Christ Jesus and, and doing this so that not only the people in prisons and the family members, but that the, the person that walks through these doors in this church can come to the strength and the knowledge and the understanding that this life is worth living. You, you follow me? I spent a lot of years on this earth. Struggled, I struggled for the, I'm talking about, I talked to a guy today, I used to go in the old jail with him. And he watched me struggle for years. And I finally just threw up my hands and quit because I thought I had to carry all the load when I, when I didn't know that I was supposed to cast all my cares on him. I didn't know that he was the one that had made me the righteousness of God in him. I thought something that I had to do, and every time I made a mistake, I felt like that, you know, I had to go back and start all over again. That's not Christianity. That's misery. That's, that's misery. It's a vicious cycle that religion will put people in. They, every time they make a mistake, well, you got to go back and start all over. Beg God to do something. I had an altar call to church over the weekend. I, says, I said, listen, I said, I'm not, I'm not one to drag out an altar call. This is a decision that you make. And I explained to them what I explained to a lot of people here on these videos when I preach at this church. But I explained to them as, as best I knew how, how that 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will forgive you if you'll ask Him. That's not a, that, that ain't, ain't a doubt in my mind that He'll do that. But I, I wanted that church to know, and I want, to, I want the people that, that listen to this video years from now to know that 1 John was wrote to the church. 1 John was wrote to born-again children of God. 1 God... First John was born or was written to the to the born again people that John was dealing with. They were they were saved, but there and and the, the pastor's wife said something after the service. She said, "You know, you're right." She said, "A lot of people go around begging God to forgive them, and they've never been born again. They've never they've never given Jesus Christ their heart and their life. They think." At begging him to forgive them is salvation. But it's not. And she she seen, she heard me say that and she caught on to what I was what I done. I said, That God, it's great that you're gonna ask God to forgive you, but you have to understand who those people were that, that John was dealing with. They were they were the church, they were born again people. And he wanted them to know when you mess up, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I said, but I want you to understand that salvation is a decision that every one of us has to make. And it's the decision whether or not we're going to allow Jesus Christ to be Lord of our life. Whether or not we're going to ask Him to not only forgive us, but to save us. And, and, and bear us into God's kingdom. Through his sacrifice. Romans 10 and 9 says, If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, it says you shall be saved. 
It don't say you might be if you're good enough. It don't say you might be if you're a good enough fella. It says if you'll confess him and believe in your heart that God done what he said he done and that, ra- that was raised him from the dead, he says you shall be saved. It says for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And I never, I never understood that really until I started figuring out who I was in Christ because I never thought I was righteous to start with. I thought I was just, I was just glad to be where I was at and a lot of people had told me, you just lucky to be here. No, no. It says, where with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's all it takes to be born again. I'm not one of these that, that'll get out and then spend 30 minutes trying to, get some, trying to get somebody to move. I'm going to promise you something. If I can talk you into something, the devil can talk you out of it. I want God to deal with you. I want you, I want you to come to understand how simple salvation is. It's a simple decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And then when you get born again, find out what his word says about you. And I'm going to say this in a church house and to hell with everything else because all the doubt, fear, and unbelief of this world in hell is exactly where it belongs. That's exactly where it belongs. Hold your head up high and know who God has made you to be through the perfectness, the perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice that you couldn't pay for that God freely gave you for your faith in Him. That's what salvation is. And and when you mess up, don't run from Him. I run from Him for uh, for a dozen years because I didn't know who I was. Ten years ago, eleven years ago down, when I came back to God, I told I told a boy today, sitting in his living room, I said, I said, I came back to the Lord in 2012. I said, and I'm going to sit here and tell you something that I ain't told a lot of people. I said, but if it hadn't have been for me getting hold of what that book says about me, in 2000, at the end of 2014, starting into 2015, I said I'd have backslid again. And I said I'd have been a bigger drunk than I was when I got started the first time. And that's the honest truth. Because I was in the same boat that I was in when I threw up my hands and quit. That same old shame, condemnation, and feeling like, it, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to do all I can do and... and and work as hard as I can work and hope everything works out. No. He worked it out a long time ago for me. He worked it out a long time ago for everybody in here. And all we've got to do is come to the conclusion that his word is true above everything how we feel. And, and don't let the devil lie to you. So tonight, if you've never been born again, make Jesus Lord. Make him Lord tonight and allow him to do what you can't do, and then get in this study with us. Go back to the beginning of this video, these videos, week one, or if you're listening to the podcast, go back to June 21st of 2021 and come through this study with us and find out who Christ made you to be in his sacrifice, in his goodness. Now today I'm going to ask them to go ahead and, and sign off